it is time for us to begin our meeting. Rotary Club of Salem is hereby convened on this Wednesday, May the 20th, 2020. And if you will please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Well, uh, it's really interesting to be part of this time and I really appreciate everyone for your willingness to join. Uh, we are up to 66 participants so far this week and I imagine that we'll have folks continue to join um, throughout the meeting or in these next few minutes. So welcome everyone. It is my privilege and honor to be your president, Tammy Denny with Oregon Dairy Farmers Association uh, in this, our 100th year. With our invocation, Alicia Bay. Please join me in an attitude of prayer. We are grateful for the opportunity to virtually gather today as members of Rotary. We pray that we are ever mindful of opportunities to render our service to fellow citizens and to our community, keeping in mind always the enduring values of life exerting our efforts in those areas and on those things upon which future generations can build with confidence. Let us continue to strive to make a better world during these challenging times. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Alicia. Okay, and bell ringers, and did Lois happen to join us? Okay, hearing that we have silence there. Oh, Chuck has an announcement. Brenna, can you unmute him, please? Kelly says he's not joining us and he sent, he's trying to get a hold of Lois. Okay, well, we'll just take, we'll open bell ringers from the floor then. I know that Lois's job has uh, kind of really um, been very demanding. So it, she's probably just in a very difficult time today. So nothing but grace coming from this group. Um, bell ringers then will open it from the floor. Do we have any hands go up yet, Brenna? Do you see anybody? Not yet. Okay. Oh, Chuck's hand is up, so... The people that sent Lois one may want to do theirs from the floor. Yes, absolutely. Did anyone send a bell ringer in? If you did, please go into the participant screen and click by your name, and that, that will raise your hand, and we'll call on you. So, Deb Patterson, go ahead. Um, I'm ringing the bell because, um, as our club's tradition is to uh, ring the bell if your name is in the paper. So I'm grateful for the opportunity to have had my name in the paper for an attempt to be of service to the community. So, so thank you. And congratulations. And thank you, Chuck, for thank you, Chuck, for the bills you sent out for our dues. I'm also grateful for to being able to be a Rotary member again next year. So okay, ringing the bell. Hey. All hey, right. can you see me? Uh, is it Ozzy? I hear your voice. Okay, yeah, I don't well, I, see your face, but I hear your. I see your name is on the screen. So. And I don't know why uh, I can't do that. But anyway, I'll ring the bell because I'm still learning how to run this damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to print that. So are we ringing the bell one time, Ozzy? <laughs> Well, now I lost it again, but... Okay, here we go. Ring in the bell for Ozzy. Because he doesn't know how to run the damn thing. Okay. All right, oh. Don. Don. Oh, I am excited because um, I am now symmetrical. I got my left hip last Monday. So I have a new left hip, and I don't walk crooked any longer. Excellent. So I'm so excited about that. Ring in the bell. You're like the bionic woman, Don. Okay. Are there any other bell ringers? Do you see anybody, Brenna? Or am I missing anybody? Warren. Warren. Okay. So my wife is going to ring the bell. Yes, and I'm. I'm. This is dovetail on on Don. I'm glad she got her new left hip. I'm going to get a new left knee next Thursday, May 28th. So I'm finally going to get it. <laughs> hey, ringing the bell. For new body parts. <laughs> any, any other bell ringing going on? Yeah. 
Tim Nissen. Tim Nissen, go for it. As a treasurer of the Salem Rotary Foundation, it gives me great pleasure to keep track of these bell ringers every week. And so I'd like to ring the bell for the bell ringer uh, committee. I'm reporting to the Salem Rotary Foundation board this afternoon on our various results and our ambitious goal for bell ringers this year was $11,000 and we're at 11,460 plus whatever comes our way today. So once again, we uh, exceed expectations. For uh, those of you who have rung the bell in the last uh, four or five weeks who have not yet paid, we have your name and we'll be following up with you. Excellent, so ring in the bell. Ring the bell. Thank you for that report, Kim, that's great. Uh, do we have any other bell ringers from the floor? Yep, Jen Columbus. Jen Columbus, go for it. Hi everybody, um, I am ringing the bell um, on behalf of myself and my husband, Alex Paraskevas. Um, for our speaker today, Molly McCarger. She is a longtime friend and she was actually our boss in college at the Jervis School District. So she is such an incredible leader and we are really excited to have her presenting today and to hear more. So thanks Molly for being here. Ring in the bell. All right, Anne Syret, go ahead. I unmuted you, but you might also need to unmute yourself. Got it. I got it. All right. I think I'm good now. Uh, this is a very personal one. Um, I actually now have, for the first time in my life, a vegetable garden. And so far, I've got 15 kinds of herbs and three kinds of tomatoes and two kinds of squash and two kinds of uh, uh, cucumbers and some peppers. And so far, I haven't killed it yet. So ring the bell. That's hilarious. Okay, anybody else? Linda Norris. Okay, Linda Norris. Hey, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. I wanted to ring the bell for Vanessa and uh, Deb Patterson and all the other people who are willing to put their names up to serve the public. It's a tough job anyway and even tougher, I think, in these times. So I really appreciate them doing that. Good one. Okay, ring in the bell. You so much appreciate it those. yeah congratulations okay so now are, are there any other bell ringers from the floor anybody else want to put their hand up okay this is my bell ringer what movie is a cow's favorite the sound of music okay all right we're done um now um going to from bell ringers then to our peace moment deb patterson Oh, and I'm it. Yay. Well, thank you. Um, since today our program is about um, farming, I wanted to share that I grew up on a farm, which was a great experience, and I have wonderful memories. We grew, we grew wheat, oats, barley, and rye um, to sell, and had cows, pigs, chickens to supplement the family garden and to fill our freezer and pantry. Nobody ever stops moving for long on a farm there's always something to be done. And even when the chores are done for one day, there are chores to be done the next. Growing up, and yet, and yet there's real peace that can be found on a farm. There's always peace in nature. There's peace in time spent with family and peace in time spent alone. Growing up on a farm instills great values in young people, teaching them the value of hard work. Farming is not easy teaching them the value of patience. Crops don't grow overnight. And sometimes there's hail, teaching them to always have hope. Who could possibly be a farmer if they didn't have hope? Next year, there might not be hail. And teaching them to appreciate the moment, the smell of hay, the taste of a vegetable straight out of the garden, the growing warmth of the early morning sun, and the benediction of sunset over a rich and full day. There is peace to be found in each of these things. So thank you to the farmers who work so hard so that we can all have food. May they know the peace that comes from making such a meaningful contribution to the good of all. Thanks. 
Thank you, Deb. Thank you. All right, announcements. I have a couple and then we'll move uh, from these to Claudia and then Barry Nelson. Uh, we have an announcement about one of our members in our club, uh, Blaine Kuhn. He served as secretary of our Rotary Club for 14 years. He re is a retired director of the Cas Cascade Council of Boy Scouts and is now an honorary member of our club. He and his wife, Barbara, have both been diagnosed with COVID. They were tested at the end of April. She tested positive and is at the end of her 14-day incubation period. Blaine tested, test results were false negative. When retested May 7th, he did test positive. Their daughter, Sarah, says he's a bit more tired, um, has a decreased appetite and has slowed down a bit. But at 95, she's hopeful for their complete recovery. So his contact information is in our DACDB online directory or it is in your printed directory. Uh, we're encouraging club members, if you'd like, send a note um, of just good wishes for speedy recovery from them both. So we wanted to be sure that you knew that. Thank you, Holly Berry, for putting that announcement together. Uh, also for our treasurer, uh, Chuck Swank, he is uh, advising me that the uh, dues notices that were sent out last week are resulting in a really good response from club members. Uh, remember, you can pay online now. You can go to the Grove Mueller Swank website and click on a, make an online uh, donation in a safe portal uh, and uh, make your dues payable uh, through that or send a check in, whatever works for you. And if you need to make arrangements, please just let Chuck know. So uh, thank you for that, Chuck. Um, yesterday, Rotary International went live on Facebook and they'll have a weekly live uh, pre um, presentation. So you can find that on Facebook and play it back at your leisure. I looked at um, yesterday's or this morning's sometime today. Uh, it's very interesting. It's update and it gives you a sense of what's happening from the Rotary International um, preference and stage where you know we have a Rotary International president who's staying home and not traveling. So it's all very interesting. I hope you'll give it a look. Um, now, Claudia, you have the floor. Hi, thank you. So as your vocational chair, oh, I'm Claudia Vorce, your vocational chair. And um, thank you to everyone that joined in to the Salem City Club meeting last Friday at noon. Uh, we have the opportunity, they got the opportunity to um, hear Deputy Chief Belshaw talk about the current uh, Salem Police uh, building, uh, what the progress, what's left to do, how soon we'll get our tour, that kind of thing. Um, what we have coming up this Friday is our own Mark Hunter talking about the uh, UGM building that's going up right now, what's going on with that. And um, then the following Friday, we have Rich Duncan talking about some of the other construction projects that are going on downtown. So our skyline is changing. If you're interested in joining those noon Zoom webinars, uh, please email me and you can email me at Claudia at prsalem.com, which is also found in DACDB. And um, I can send you the link. You do have to register. It's free, but the registration actually sends you the link to join the meeting. So uh, if anybody wants to do that, send me an email. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Mm -hmm. Gary Nelson. Well, thank you, and, and we have another construction project that I'm going to talk about, uh, and if I'm uh, technologically sophisticated enough to share my screen with you, I'm going to do that. It looks like I may have been successful. You are. Um, so in the midst of, of this very unusual time, we continue to, to drive forward with our centennial project, and we're incredibly fortunate to have entered this time uh, in the position we are from a fundraising standpoint with less than $340,000 to go toward our $4 million goal. Uh, and this chart is something that we have formed and molded over time, uh, but you can see that you have done an awesome job leading the way in your financial commitment to get this done. Uh, of course, if you haven't yet had the opportunity to participate, you can contact uh, Tim Nissen or anyone on the task force and, and we'll be happy to help you. But really today we want to share with you some exciting uh, new images and 
Uh, so we're, we're looking at the, the latest and greatest renderings depicting what you'll see in Riverfront Park about a year from now. Um, you should see dirt beginning to turn in July, so just a couple of months, and the current construction schedule targets completion in the summer of 2021. While we're sharing these renderings with you, given uh, the, the oh, turbulence of the, the situation right now and so many suffering in our community, uh, the task force thinks it's appropriate to keep these Im images close to the vest and, and uh, stay out of the way of the social service organizations um, that uh, are providing for those in, in great need right now. So it, it will be about November that the structure actually begins to uh, take form and, and come out of the ground. So we're uh, thinking that we'll plan to make more of a public splash with updated images and renderings uh, about that time. I'm going to attempt to take a pointer here and, and show you around a bit in that um, uh, you can see the, the current parking lot is the, the light colored over here and then this dark line is uh, kind of the property line or where things will begin to expand. And, and so you'll see an expanded parking lot and an entry plaza over near uh, that edge of the property and it's from the, the edge of that entry plaza uh, that this next slide um, begins. And so we're going to take a, a speed walk uh, through the amphitheater here. Of course, the, the bridge and Minto Island off to the right. And uh, as we approach the, the stage here, we'll see the color changing LED lights that will be in the floor that light uh, the basket weave and uh, the, the roof, uh, which is weather tight, but you can see it's translucence uh, so that uh, you'll be able to see the weave. And I think at night it's going to be particularly stunning. The berm over here provides uh, both um, uh, all kind of a masking of the mechanical room as well as covers uh, artist or performer vehicles, which may be uh, behind that and, and an artist area back there. Um, and uh, the, the mechanical room behind that rotary logo there. Uh, and that rotary logo is really going to be something. It, it's uh, about seven and a half feet in radius. Um, it's stainless steel set into the concrete. And so uh, it, it, it folds uh, from the wall onto the floor with half of it uh, on the wall and half on the floor uh, and really going to make quite a statement. Um, we've uh, picked up a lot of really good ideas along the way, and, and it was the enthusiasm of Portland Rotarian Al Jubitz, um, and appropriate that we had a, a peace moment today from Deb, um, that started a messaging conversation that remains ongoing, um, and, and while yet to be refined, we envision the footings uh, in each corner holding elegant messages of, of peace and community uh, tying it back to Rotary. So these are a couple of concepts and, and the, those messages would also be uh, stainless steel set into the concrete. Um, the wall that faces the stage here that, that has kind of a dark area on it, um, uh, just off the, the Rotary logo, uh, that's where uh, we'll have an opportunity. That, that will be 12 feet wide by seven feet high stainless steel, and, and that's where we'll recognize the stories of uh, Rotary's service and legacy and how this project came to be uh, of Jerry's service and legacy to the community and, and Oregon and the cultural inspiration of the Kalapuya open weave basket. And, and this is also where we anticipate recognizing those who have contributed to the campaign. So there will be that opportunity to uh, continue to share the stories that we've been sharing along the way uh, for generations to come surrounding this. So you can be incredibly proud of, of what's to come. It's a, a pleasure to be a part of it. Uh, my door remains open, or at least my phone line remains open, uh, should you have questions or, or wish to talk about the project. But we're uh, in really good shape, and you're going to start seeing uh, some turning of the dirt in July, uh, but given the current circumstances, we're not going to be engaging in a, a formal uh, ceremonial groundbreaking or anything of that nature. 
but again, wanted to share with you, uh, given your leadership in this, uh, the latest renderings and, and that animation. Thank you, Barry. I think that deserves a big salute and thank you because without the leadership coming from Barry and the rest of the task force, Ken Von Osdahl, and I know uh, past president Russ and Renee and Claudia have all been instrumental in those conversations and Dale Penn as well. Um, thank you everyone who's serving on that task force and thank you for that really wonderful update. It's a wonderful to receive positive information. Um, thank you again. Um, Holly, I understand you have an announcement. I do. Thank you, Tammy. Um, I just wanted to remind everybody that we have now gone, since we've gone to this virtual meeting, we are taking attendance. So if you are logging in or signing in, um, you get credit for the meeting and you do not have to file or submit a makeup for these meetings because you're already getting credit for it. So it's all taken care of. Don't need, you don't need to, to double dip onto that one. Excellent. Thank you, Holly, for that reminder. Uh, and then any members that you might come in contact with, those of you who have participated today, re you can remind them that we will send a link um, out to everyone uh, in our mailing list so that they can watch a meeting after if they uh, don't have the opportunity to catch it when we are in a live setting. Um, and then one final announcement, sorry, it's not such happy news, but it's kind of what's happening with uh, mass gatherings right now. The Rotary Multi-Sport event, John Shirley, I didn't see John on the, in the meeting, um, in our meeting house today, but uh, John advised the board, a Rotary board last week, that the multi-sport uh, will not occur in 2020. So sorry to be the bearer of that news, but wanted to be sure you uh, are aware. Richard Pine, thank you for that reminder because Richard heard it um, elsewhere in another club meeting yesterday. So I wanted our club to be aware of that. Um, I don't believe there are any other announcements. Did I miss anyone? Don't want to leave you out. Okay, Claudia, go ahead. You're on mute. Okay, sorry. So um, I just had somebody text me and I don't know who they are. So please email me and I will get the link to them. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Okay. Or she prefers the announcement email. Um, okay, or your um, willingness to participate in that vocational event via email. We okay. have one more. We have one more from Vanessa. Okay, Vanessa, is it a club, a club announcement? Nope, just a general announcement. Okay, it, um, those would be bell ringers then. Okay, sure. Back? I'll ring a bell then. Okay, ring a bell, girlfriend. All right. Thank you so much, President Tammy. And I just want to say thank you to everyone for what has been an extraordinarily unusual last six months or so. But I'm extremely honored and humbled to have been selected by the voters for Salem City Council for a full four-year term. And so uh, if any of you have any questions for me, whether I represent you or not, uh, Rotary has a friend on City Council. And so please let me know if there's anything you'd like to bring to my attention in the years to come. But I'm deeply honored and humbled by the results from last night and look forward to working together for a brighter future for Salem. Okay. Thank you, President Tammy. And Thank ring you, the bell. Rebecca. Okay. All righty. I believe, is that everybody? Did I miss anything, Brenda? Okay. Um, we now are up to 76 attendees today, so that's excellent. Uh, John McCulley is our program chair, and I'm going to turn it over to John. You have the microphone, sir. Okay. Thank you very much, President Tammy and fellow Rotarians. I'm going to take a page from uh, Warren Bednar's uh, program chairmanship and introduce a head table today, actually a spotlight Zoom head table. Uh, I first want to uh, highlight Emily Swart. Emily is the, uh, I get it right here, annual giving uh, coordinator for Western Oregon University. And since our speaker today graduated from Western Oregon University, I thought it would be good to have a representative from Western uh, sit at the kitchen table or wherever Emily may be today. Uh, the next person at our head table is Robin Kerner. Hi, Robin. Um, Robin is the philanthropic gifts manager at Marion Polk Food Share also a graduate of Western Oregon University. Um, and Marion Polk Food Share is um, a, a, especially supported 
by Pyramine Farms, and Molly's going to um, talk about Pyramine Farms in a little bit. Molly also serves on the um, Marion Polk Food Share Food Resource Advisory Committee. So I thought it's appropriate to have Marion Polk Food Share represented at our head table today. So thank you, Robin. I'll now introduce our speaker, um, Molly McCarger. Uh, Molly lives and farms near Jervis with her younger brother, Ernie, and this is the fourth generation of the family on the farm. Uh, she grew up and worked summers on the farm. She graduated, as I said, from Western Oregon University with a Bachelor of Science in Health Education and Sports Leadership. She was the Membership Services Coordinator for the Boys and Girls Club of Salem, Marion, and Polk Counties before returning to the Jervis uh, School District where she started an after-school program for the Jervis Middle School, was a substitute teacher, and the Jervis High School varsity football and <laughs> varsity volleyball, not football, <laughs> volleyball, and softball coach for several years. Uh, 15 years ago, she retired from teaching and returned to the farm. Uh, Molly's gonna talk about her farm, but she's involved in a lot of things. She serves as a board member for the Resource Education and Agriculture Leadership Program. She's on the board of Farmers Ending Hunger and Oregon Ag Link and the Oregon Ag Link Foundation. In addition, she is a member of the Oregon Farm Bureau Labor Committee and the Oregon Ag Link Adopt a Farmer Committee. She also serves on the advisory committee for the Agribusiness Management Program at Chemeketa Community College. And as I mentioned, the new uh, Food Resource Advisory Committee for Marion Polk Food Chair. Uh, she was a past member of the Jervis School Board where she served eight years and was the 2015-16 campaign chair for United Way of the Mid Willamette Valley. Uh, Molly and her husband, Lindsay, have been married 18 years. They have four wonderful girls, uh, ranging in age from 16 to 7. All the girls attend Jervis uh, School in the Jervis School District. And Lindsay is a health and technology uh, CTE teacher at Jervis High School. And as you look at Molly's background, the background of her office, you may notice a Chicago Cubs jersey and some other memorabilia. She is a diehard Chicago Cubs fan. So please welcome Molly McCarter. Thank you, John. So this is fun. This is the first time I've done one of these. I'm sure many of you can uh, attest to, to that as well. Um, and yes, uh, big time Cubs fan, uh, over, clearly over involved, um, uh, but I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, I would like to start first. I will, I'm going to pop up my presentation um, and I've got some slides and some little videos linked in there and you can, um, you'll have to bear with me because I, for some reason on my Chromebook, I disappear when I pop up my presentation. So if I look like I'm doing something funny, somebody say something, if I, my face pops out of the screen for some reason, um, but hopefully I won't move. So yeah, I, my brother and I are fourth generation uh, farm farmers here um, and my great grandparents started farming in the Kaiser area. Um, if any of you are familiar with where Los Dos Hermanos Mexican restaurant is across from the Kaiser uh, Skyline Ford, that is where our homestead uh, originally was before they moved out to the farm here in Jervis. So um, we've been around for a while and farming for um, just as long. Um, so with that, I want to pop, I'm going to pop my screen over to my presentation and we shall, and then I would like to, let's see if I can do this right. Um, I'm going to go here and then we're going to hit present. Now I'm gone. So if I do something funny, I apologize. Um, but I wanted to acknowledge, um, I believe it was Deb who did, um, spoke for a moment about peace and that peace in farming, which is perfect segue for my, this, this first slide. Um, this is, this is the view, uh, out of my house. Uh, well, when the sun cooperates in the morning, we get these sun sunrises. Um, and if, if that isn't peaceful, I, I don't know what is. Um, so, so that was, that was perfect. Uh, Deb, thank you. And you're right. This provides, I mean, we have to be hopeful as farmers. Um, that's what this season is going to um, 
well, it's about every season, but this season, I think, especially, we're hopeful. Um, I think we have to be ultimate optimists because if we weren't, we would not um, probably survive this profession. Um, but there is a there is a lot of peace in what we do, so it's is fantastic. Um, so moving along, here's a quick Pyramine Farms. Um, my grandfather, right there in the middle. Uh, 84 years that we've been here at this location. Um, and my dad and uncle took over from my grandparents in uh, officially they, uh, was like 1976, I believe, uh, transferred to their uh, sole custody of ownership and grandma and grandpa were just uh, retired, hanging out on the farm. And then in 2011, my uncle retired and my brother and I took over day-to-day um, -day operations um, almost 100% and dad is a uh, high-paid consultant is what we like to refer to him as um, and then there's the fourth generation down there in the corner so far I'm the only one with kiddos and there that was a couple of years ago but if that picture doesn't say tell it all I don't know what does that's what I've got in store for me um, they are a little bit older now and a little bit sassier um, there's a little crop history of what we grow or what we have grown um, over the years and I'm sure I have left things off. I, I, well, I know that I did. I know that I left off uh, sheep, hogs, um, and a variety of other livestock that my grandpa started getting rid of when he took over from my great grandparents and that my dad and uncle finished off when they took over from my grandparents. So currently the only livestock we have are 4-H and FFA animals. But um, that's kind of a quick history of some of the things that we have grown on the farm. And there will be, I believe, time for questions at the end. So as I go through, please um, make sure that you write down a question and I hope I can answer them at the end. And I wanted to go ahead and I, my brother, we bought a drone. So he's a rookie at this drone thing, but we were messing around and I'm gonna speed it up so we don't have to watch it super slow but as we talk we're right on the uh, willamette river there it is and that is the start of um our farm off the off the river that brown field actually currently is an organic field we do have uh 68 acres certified organic and with another 30 that we're transitioning it should be certified by next year um that's probably about all we'll do and the rest of it we do farm conventionally. So as we just kind of fly over, you'll just get to see um, some of the fields. And this is from a couple of summers ago. So it's, uh, it will look a little different come this summer and hopefully we'll get another flyby. This right here is our wetland. We have a 90 acres that we have um, put back into a wetland reserve through a partnership with Ducks Unlimited and Natural Resource Conservation at the NRCS, their um, federal government program. And uh, so that is just there for nature. And we have a bass pond that we go down and fish on it and it's a pretty cool little project. So flying over our hop fields out towards the front of our um, farm and we are right off a of river road. The, if you're familiar, it goes, uh, it connects through Salem, Kaiser, all the way to St. Paul, the Newburgh. So we're kind of, smack dab between Kaiser and St. Paul on River Road. Um, and it's kind of cool just to see it fly over. There's our cherry orchard and then over uh, Patterson Creek and then the neighbor right there build a nice new house. Um, but back over into the farm and we'll be coming up on a spot where my, my brother's house is and my parents. We all get to live out here uh, together. It's a nice 900 acre, um, I guess, isolated commune. Uh, compounds. Um, but uh, again, I would not trade what I think I do these days and where I live for just about anything. So uh, we're coming up on the end of this video. It's, it's way better when you speed it up, by the way. Um, there's my brother's house flying over what was a clover field and will be a cauliflower field this summer. So it's kind of fun to see that aerial view. Um, and then, so I would like to start getting into some of the things that we currently are growing and I'll quickly list them. This year, 
Uh, we are a little less diversified than we normally are. Um, we've usually on any given summer had 11 to 13 different crops growing this year uh, with a lot of changes and, and I'll talk about those here soon. We are down to just a small handful and we've been growing sweet cherries for uh, processing so they end up as maraschino uh, cherries. We've been growing those since, uh, well, let's see, my great-grandmother was one of the first founding members of the Lambert Cherry Growers in 1932, so at least that long. Um, and it's the one thing that uh, we hopefully will be able to continue to grow. Um, we it is a very labor-intensive crop, and so that is our challenge, and I'll talk about that here in a minute. One of the, some of the other things that we do grow are hops, and I'll, and I'll skip through some slides to those things here soon, but this year we, have, we all have, we have hops, we have sweet corn, cauliflower, and some white clover, I believe, squash, and some tall fescue and perennial ryegrass. So we have historically, since 1972, grown cauliflower for NORPAC. We've been members, we, let me rephrase this, I'm having a new train of thought. We were members had been members for 48 years of, of NORPAC uh, up until, as many of you are probably familiar with, uh, the bankruptcy um, last year. That, um, and so from those 48 years, our first con uh, contract was with call for cauliflower, and then we also started growing broccoli in 1974. I was born in 1976, so those crops have been around here longer than I have. Um, this will be our first official summer without broccoli. We have made a lot of uh, decisions over the last five months, six months, and that was one of them was to um, eliminate that out of our rotation. Um, we also have grown green beans for, well, as long as I can remember. Um, and we are not growing green beans this year um, for the first time. Sweet corn, we've taken some time off and we're back in it again. Um, and uh, we'll kind of get through those things here in a minute when I hit the slides. But I want to talk a little bit about NORPAC first really fast. And I'm just going to keep my sweet cherry slide up. Um, or actually, you know what? Let me, we'll get to that in a second. I'll, I'll do it in order here. So here's our, here's our cherries. Uh, that, so some of what we grow, Royal Ann, Sweetheart, Lapin, Quorum. And we have a cherry called a Viola. That is my grandmother's name. My great grandfather had grafted a cherry. It's a dark cherry that you can only find on Pure Mine Farms. Um, it's similar to like a Bing, so it's um, sweet and juicy, um, but it is not like the rest of them. And so my great grandfather um, thought they were plump and juicy, like my grandmother, and 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 sweet, like my grandmother apparently. So that's why he decided to name them Viola after her. So. It's kind of a fun little family story. Um, so what, when I, I mentioned cherries and the fact that it is labor intensive, um, and uh, after talking with John and Tammy, um, I thought we'd talk about some of the things that we're all having to deal with with this COVID-19 and uh, in, in our workplaces and the stay at home orders. And, and obviously farming, we are essential, considered an essential um, uh, position and everybody has to eat um, and we are working on doing our best to make sure that all of our employees which is if you count my brother and I there's only six of us year round if you count the two of us so um, we have a lot of seasonal uh, um, help and our cherry crew is one of those groups and our cherry crew has been coming from California since, well, since forever, um, forever and ever. My grandparents, so Miguel, the gentleman that runs the crew now, is my generation, essentially, uh, for Cherry Crew, um, for the most part. His brother and sister-in-law ran the crew before him. He's quite a bit younger than his brother, but they ran the crew before him, and before Susie and Alejandro, ran the crew, uh, Susie's parents ran the cherry crew for my, grand, for my grandparents. So we've kind of gone through these generational shifts here. And, um, and it's, so I've grown up with a lot of the, the folks that come up. Um, they are like family. Um, and 
they are a skilled, it is a skilled, um, uh, it, let's just say dad made us all pick cherries one time and we got fired. It's not easy. Um, and we weren't very good at it. So it, it's definitely a, a, a skill that uh, not everybody has. And they, um, they pick, start picking cherries in California down near Bakersfield in about mid-April and they pick all the way up through Stockton, um, finish in Stockton in around um, early June. And then they come on up here. They, it's kinda, they know when the season's ready to start and they start showing up about a week before or three day, four days before cherry harvest. And, and, and we provide housing for the crew that comes up. And that's what you're looking at here on the screen. Um, and, and we're in the process of getting things cleaned up. We've had to make a lot of changes because of COVID-19. Um, Oregon OSHA was uh, petitioned by the Oregon Law Center to um, change some rules for farm labor. And one of them was for housing. And um, we are required to provide 100 square feet um, per person in each house and with a 50 uh, square foot living sp or bedroom space um, per person. So the, we have bunk beds. We've had a lot of uh, queens and some and some foals and with an occasional twin in these cabins. Um, and so the the pictures on the um, top, I guess, uh, well, my left, maybe that's what everybody's is, um, the long building. Uh, that with the picnic tables in front of it, that one, those houses, those um, can hold five people. And then the, there's another set of cabins that have some plywood, it looks like in front of the windows. Those each can house four uh, folks. And with the new rules for, temporary rules for this summer, we are required to provide six feet of space between each bed in every direction. Um, and if we cannot provide that, then we have to build a barrier um, with allowing 28 inches between the barrier and the bed, obviously for to be able to you know, move around and then not block um, escape if there's need for a fire escape. Um, and we had to remove all bunk beds. So we are down to um, uh, single twin beds at this point because um, we need to be able to maximize our space and try to get six feet between each of the beds the best we possibly can. Uh, our camp is, we're all farm labor housing is registered with Oregon OSHA. Uh, they come out and do inspections and there's a long list of requirements that we are, uh, um, we meet. Um, and so our house, our housing is, um, has a 60 person capacity roughly, depending on if the families, um, the sizes that come, uh, little kids get a little bit less living space there. Uh, so, but we don't really have uh, youth come up anymore that often. Um, and so we went from 60 with OSHA's new rules down to being able to house roughly 24 people. And that provides a problem, especially this year, because we probably have one of the top five cherry crops sitting in the trees right now that we've had in um, 30 years. So we need all of the crew that we can possibly get. Um, finding local cherry harvesters is not as easy as it, um, it's not easy. And then when you start mixing crews, when you have your original crew and you start mixing others, it, it, there's a dynamic there that can, can pose a challenge. So, so I, there's been some changes. I've had the privilege of being on a, um, a few committees, my Zoom committees at whatever um, listening sessions and um, provided some feedback to some folks from the governor's office. And they, went, they made some changes that would allow us to put a bed in the living space as well. So down in the bottom of the screen, you'll see a green table and one wood frame bed. That is the living space in one of the cabins and we're allowed to um, now put a bed out there where uh, previously if OSHA were to come out and inspect, that would not be um, allowable. That way we can utilize and maximize our space. So now because of that, we back up to about maybe 48 in um, the camp, which still not 60. 
um, and we're going to do our best to figure out what to do. Um, um, so with that, some of the challenges come, um, the, the governor's office is looking to try to help um, provide some resources for farmers around and for farm workers around the state, um, including potentially hopefully um, hotel vouchers so that if we are in need of putting up additional crew um, into hotels, we can do that. Um, there's a lot of other issues that that may pose um, and we can get into those later. But with that uh, said, it's not going to be a smooth sailing cherry harvest, I don't think. Um, some of the other requirements that OSHA has come out with is sanitation, um, as can be expected. Uh, we are also now required to sanitize um, all the high touch um, contact uh, locations in the labor camp twice a day. So I either we assign someone to be that sanitation person and they go into the to each of the cabins twice a day and sanitize the kitchen, the um, bathrooms, all the high touch places, and then also into the uh, restrooms. Um, some of our cabins don't have built-in restrooms. We have a shower house, which is in the top corner up there, which that has a couple doors open, you can tell. Um, that, um, that's kind of like a, you know, think of a, a camp when you go camp, you know, at a campground. That's kind of what those the shower houses are. And so we'll have to have somebody clean those twice a day as well. Um, we do pull in extra porta potties for our labor camp, just, um, just because, and we will have to sanitize those uh, three times a day in addition to their normal servicing. Um, we are also now required uh, in the field for sanitation. So the cherry crew, when they're out picking, we, uh, the rules usually are one toilet per 20 people. And so we will have, you know, usually have four, four portable restrooms and hand washing stations out in the cherry um, orchard. We're now, that number is now down to one to 10 ratio. So we have had to invest in additional toilets, um, which do not come at a cheap cost if you're purchasing them. And if you want to rent them, good luck. So if anybody's looking to rent a porta potty in the next uh, four months, you may be out of luck because they're gonna be on farms all across the state. Um, they did an assessment and realized that there would be about a 3000 porta potty uh, shortage uh, just to fulfill the need for agriculture and, and the new one to 10 ratio. So, um, so we've got some issues. Uh, and, and when those are out in the field, we also are required to sanitize those three times a day as well and have additional hand washing um, stations. So um, doing the math on what that would take, I figured uh, it would be a, about a nine hour a day job, seven days a week. So I would have to hire somebody just for the summer to do that uh, sanitation only at an additional roughly thousand dollars a week. Um, so we're having some added expenses because of our housing, uh, the bedding in our housing, we've had to remove, uh, you'll, there is a few beds you'll see in there, and, but we've had to remove all of the bunk beds and, and I've had to purchase uh, a lot of new twin frames and twin mattresses. So right now, just to get the camp ready for harvest this summer, I've spent roughly $12,000 and it's, and I'm not done yet, unfortunately. So, but we're willing to do it um, because it's, an, it's important for our crew to stay healthy and, and um, that's what we want to do. And hopefully I can start finding more sanitation supplies. I've been, I feel like I'm a hoarder of those things these days. Anytime I go to Lowe's or Home Depot or Target or anywhere, I'm picking up whatever I can find because I have to provide um, all of those clean supplies for each of the cabins as well, um, in addition. So uh, so if anybody has any hot tips on where to find uh, disinfectant wipes, let me know. So um, with that, we'll move on. We don't want to keep looking at that picture anymore. Uh, hops, that's another um, crop that we are actually new to. We just started growing these about five years ago. And uh, they saved the farm. And I think that's a, actually a very accurate statement. So we can grow more on 55 acres of hops than we can. Um, we can it, 55 acres of hops doubles the gross income than 300 acres of uh, vegetables roughly do. So 
that has any perspective. We go for yeah, commodity branches. Um, there's a video if it plays. I'm going to speed myself up because I know I'm going to be running out of time here because I talk too much. Um, this is what some hop harvest looks like up there in the top corner. Trucks pull through and a tractor goes behind and cuts the top of the hops off the vines and then they end up in a kiln and there's a whole process in between leaving the field and then getting to this dried kiln portion but that's what happens. They get dried and then they are often 200 pound bales and up to the Yakima Chief Ranches to end up uh, hopefully in a little favorite beer. Um, cauliflower is another one that we grow. This is like I said earlier and I thought I would share with you Callie right there is my youngest. She, this was, this video was shot on her sixth birthday. She wanted to uh, help transplant. So she was, so that gives you an idea of what it looks like. We transplant all of our cauliflower for weed control. And um, there, that other picture is my other three older children transplanting. And as you can see that distance between each of those chairs is less than six feet. And so fortunately I have four children, well, we'll see how well Callie does, but at least three children who will be transplanting all of our cauliflower this year, along with dad and mom and maybe grandma and Daisy the dog, we'll see. Um, really keeping it within the family this summer. So that's what it looks like to plant. And then I just have a, picture, a few pictures of harvest. It's never dry, rarely when we harvest cauliflower. Uh, there's a picture of Callie holding a head. And then there's a picture of a uh, truck dumping that. I had the privilege, unfortunate privilege of hauling in the very last load of cauliflower in our pack um, at the end of the season this year, this last year. It was really an uh, interesting feeling to sit there and know that I was hauling the last load um, as NORPAC. Um, and it was just kind of a, one of those, um, anyway, it was a strange feeling. So. There's a picture of, of, of that there. Um, NORPAC has the fact that we, uh, we lost over a million and a half dollars in retains with NORPAC's bankruptcy. Um, and that's just what it was. And um, we also lost about $400,000 worth of income from last year due to it. And it really was no fault to, well, there's a lot of issues. There's a lot of things that, that happened that um, probably could have in hindsight 2020 obviously is always like oh we should have stood up and said this or things should have been done differently but it is what it is and there's a new owner um, and the new company VegCo uh, um, Mr. Frank Teague's hat is the owner of Oregon Potato Company and National Frozen Foods he has a little bit of experience with processing vegetables and he will have a lot more now after this year this is partly why we've decided to only grow cauliflower this year. Um, somewhat of a trial for us to see how, I guess, he handles everything. Um, and then we'll go from there. Um, and that's about the only thing we're growing for, for um, VegCo this year. Um, we're growing sweet corn. But we're growing sweet corn for Stalbush Island Farms down in Corvallis. And that's also who we grow our squash for. Um, you can see this little tiny kiddo in those pictures. That's my now, they're almost 13 year old. She wasn't 13 then, but she loved to ride and help in the corn picker and truck. And so a couple more years, I'll have her driving the truck instead of just helping them climb up. But, um, and this is the rest of our crop rotation. Again, we'll squash, we'll have 174 acres of that, that we'll grow for stall bush, um, some white clover, and then two different kinds of grass. Um, and let's see, as mentioned earlier, John, I loved it. Thanks for tying the Go Wolves and, um, and Marion Polk Food Chair and Elise and give her a shout out for Salem Harvest. Uh, we've been partnering with Salem Harvest since uh, almost its inception. Um, and uh, Oregon Food Bank, my cousin who grew up on the farm with me, she is one of the food resource coordinators for the Oregon Food Bank. And so, um, if, and like you meant, heard John mention, I'm on the board for Farmers Ending Hunger. Uh, clearly, we think it's important um, to help be able to feed people uh, who don't have access because I think that's, um, that's, that's an issue. And access this summer is going to look different, I think, and we'll see what that looks like. 
Uh, I think hopefully Oregon will be on the better end of things for than the rest of the country in terms of what we're seeing. Uh, we know that there are some farms in California who are having to disk in crops because their distribution sources like Food Service of America, who, you know, um, sells a lot of fresh produce to restaurants, uh, that chain has obviously stopped. And so they have had to work in, in, in crops. And I hope that that is not a thing here. And if we do know we're going to get to that point, we are fortunate enough to know that we've got partners that we can get the food to through our friends at Salem Harvest and the Food Share and the Oregon Food Bank and Farmers Ending Hunger. So hopefully we won't be disking anything in and we'll get to take advantage of our crop donation tax credit instead. Um, but ultimately we'd like to be able to harvest it and so it can get to your freezer. So um, just a few photos of some stuff. As John mentioned in my um, bio there, I tend to get overly involved. But I also, if you can't tell, um, feel like somebody needs to be a voice. And I, I would like to try to hope, hopefully be that voice for agriculture in the Willamette Valley best I can. I've worked with the Marion um, County Sheriff's Office for farm, uh, for tractor safety, or, or I should say equipment safety on uh, rural roads. I was a part of helping get um, the new uh, safety corridor uh, program passed for counties uh, to be able to um, designate safety corridors because we live in a pretty um, tough area out here as our rural roads get used as freeways these days. So, and I've had opportunities to, uh, to speak to folks like um, Senator Wyden there at, the, at the Marion Polk Food Chair about our, what we do and, and some, some um, other folks. So I bring kids out, I bring people out if you ever want to tour you know where to find me. Um, and I'll just wrap up with this. I, um, a couple of years ago, decided to hire a bunch of high school kids because we needed to cut broccoli and we were struggling with farm labor. Um, trying, and so I took it upon myself to hire a lot of kids and there's a, there's a small sample of them. And let me tell you what, it was the best experience uh, probably I'd had that summer right there was the, most fun broccoli harvest it ever had been in a very long time. Anybody wanted to tell you kids don't want to work, they don't, they've never tried to employ them and they've, or they've never put the effort into teaching them how. I had to, I finally had to tell kids, all right, I, it, their, their enthusiasm was so much so that they were showing up when I didn't need them to work, they would come. And so uh, it was pretty cool to see. And I just think that, um, uh, they're, they're the future and we need to provide them opportunities. And I think being able to have an opportunity to work on a farm will, will help um, the future. So putting other people in somebody else's shoes, let them get an idea, right? With that, there's my last one. We started with a sunrise and we'll start with a sunset. I am fortunate enough to be able to look out my back um, porch and this is the view of the farm that I have. And I, again, will not, I, I'm pretty privileged. So uh, we have a lot of challenges and every day I wake up at work already and I go to bed at work, but I, I again, wouldn't trade it, um, the challenges or what I do. So, all right, with that, Tammy, I think we should probably open it up to questions. If that's makes sense, all right. I'm gonna hit stop share so that I can see myself again. All right. Okay, um, thank you very much, Molly, for that presentation. Remember everyone, if you have a question to put yourself in the participants uh, list, just raise your hand. Uh, we only have a few minutes, so please keep your questions short. Otherwise, we'll run out of time for others to have a question. Warren Bednarz, I saw your hand first. Thank you very much. Hey, uh, first off, I just want to comment. I have a very small garden and last year we supplied 283 pounds of cucumbers to Marion Pope Food Share. Uh, I posted in the comments section, there are three different locations that I've been buying uh, sanitary supplies, uh, sanitizers, gloves, that kind of thing. Uh, Zepp is out of Chicago. We have Walter E. Nelson, which is in East Salem. Uh, and uh, there's Bulk Apothecary, which I found online. Uh, I just mounted 10 
sanitizer containers yesterday in my office buildings. So those are some places if you're looking for materials. Awesome. And it, I have one plead, plead, uh, and the plead is stop growing grass. It's driving my hay fever crazy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank Ron, you. Ron Kellerman. Uh, thank you. This was very interesting. Um, I, I saw a lot of equipment in your uh, photos there. And uh, how much of that is yours and how much of it is the people that are transporting it and, and leased? It must be a phenomenal, phenomenal multi-million dollar investment. That's a great question, Ron. Yeah, yeah. We There's actually only one tractor that we lease. The rest of them we do own. Um, and I didn't show the big picture or the big tractors and, and things. But yeah, we... Um, uh, it is a very, uh, it's not, it's not a cheap career to get into. Uh, fortunately we have been able to inherit what we have and that's, an, well, I shouldn't say inherit. <laughs> Let me rephrase that. We pay for it. Um, uh, but yeah, it's not cheap and to keep up on things, we just, um, our lease will be up on our big tractor and we just, uh, signed a new lease for another one for the fall and my brother gave me the list price, um, <clears throat> of $545,000 wow. um, for a six year lease. So um, expensive yard ornaments is what I refer to them as. We use them for about three to four weeks a year, some of them, and they sit the rest of the time. So, yep. Thank you, Molly. Uh, do we have, we have time for one more quick question. Is there anyone who has a burning question they'd like to ask Molly? Okay, Jen Columbus, you're up. It's actually Alex. Hi, Molly. Oh, okay, Alex. Yeah, Hi, yes, Alex. I, uh, honorary Rotarian today. Yes, you I are. Just, I, I could speak about this for a long time, as can you. I think you're the best. Um, actually, Molly was our one of our first bosses in that summer school program in Jervis. So I've known Molly a long time. And she's opened my eyes to so many things in agriculture. I was wondering if you could just like quickly top of your head, what would what do you wish people knew about agriculture? For me, I think I have um, like every one, every, every grower is an internationally competitive market and sort of in a commodities market. And that's really changed my perspective on sort of what farming looks like. And I think people don't understand that, um, especially in this area. But I just, from your perspective, what do you, it's sort of top of mind, what do you wish people knew? Oh, the, I, well, Alex, that's a great question. I wish uh, I knew people, I wish people knew a lot more than they do. Um, so just an example, NORPAC previously, uh, the growers grew enough vegetables each summer for every man, woman, and child in the state of Oregon to have 54 freezers full every summer. That's, I mean, that's what it used to be. I don't know what things will look like now. So clearly, uh, you and I cannot eat 54 freezers full every year to you know, have room to reload. So it's gotta go somewhere. So it is a very, um, what, and that's just Norpat growers in the state of Oregon, 250 roughly at the time. So um, yeah, it's a big market, it's a, or it's a big world and it doesn't stay here. And, um, and so when you go to the grocery store and you're looking at, now that we grow hops, I, I'm kind of, it's a little more mixed message here, but when you see your, your frozen broccoli or cauliflower prices go up, don't look for the, you know, don't, don't freak out. Just know that um, we're unfortunately price takers, um, not price makers in this se uh, setting. And, and just know that it's folks like us that are behind that. And if the price goes up, hopefully that means we're getting a penny more. I don't know, but, um, but just know that it, it comes from somewhere and it's people like me, so. Okay, well, thank you, Molly. Um, and let's, let's say thank you to Molly for a great presentation, certainly eye-opening, and we really appreciate your perspective uh, and giving us that information that we, most of us, would not have the opportunity to glean from any other source. So it's great to hear it from the farm directly and get your perspective on where our food comes from. Thank you for all of your hard work, and it doesn't stop when the season stops, I know that. So thank you, and thank you for everything that you do. You're amazing. Um, and I've had the opportunity to work with you in several um, venues and in, di in different committees, and you're the best. So thank, thank you, Molly. You. Thanks for making time. 
Um, we know that there, we kind of got wedged in with some other things that you're, um, that are also important on your calendar, but thank you so much on behalf of our club for making time for us. We really appreciate you. Okay, and back to us now as a club. Um, don't forget to look for your Rotary International information, um, those um, updates on Facebook. If you're interested, you can find them anytime and listen to them at your leisure. Um, I look forward to seeing everyone next week on the 27th. Warren Benars will be the program chair and Bill Burgess, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing his last name correctly, uh, he will give us an update on the elections process. So um, that will be timely as well. So I believe that's everything for the good of the order today. I'm going to ring the bell and I don't have to run off immediately today. So if you, we can leave this open for just a few minutes and have a little bit of conversation. We'll see where that goes, but I'm gonna ring the bell and we are officially adjourned. <laughs>